How's it going and welcome to the No Fun Lads Guide series on the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be going over all of the name locations in Chapter 2. Of course there is going to be a ton of spoilers so players do not watch this, but DMs don't want that added insight, go ahead and stick around because we have a lot to cover here. So here it is, the name locations of Chapter 2. As mentioned before in the previous video, you can theoretically tackle these however you want to allow your players to, especially if you do decide to transform this module into more of a hex crawl or maybe just a free form, you can go wherever you want instead of a point crawl. But if you're going by how it's suggested, then they will go in the order of the Slanted Tower, Telemy Hill, the Brigands Tollway, and then eventually Downfall. And of course, there's all those lovable random encounters there in the mix. So let's start going through all of these, shall we? First things first, we have the Slanty Tower. This is where, when your players are approaching it, they're going to see the debris of the balloon that they saw crashing down. Which is hopefully enough to get your players to rush over and see what's going on, but if you have players that are not curious about anything at all, then they may just skip past this. In which case, is what it is. If they do approach, they will hear pleas of help. And these are coming from Sir Talavar, the most Chad-looking fairy dragon that I have ever seen. I mean, come on, look at that debonair face, the mustache, oh my goodness. This guy is just absolutely incredible. The interesting thing about this location is as your players arrive, they may try and yell back to Sir Talavar as he's saying something out loud. But if your players do speak up, then they are ambushed by snakes. The thing is, though, is... For all that this book has been talking about in regards of, oh, you can avoid combat, one of the very first instances of an interaction with anything in this game is one of these snakes. And these snakes actually realistically have a really easy chance of just straight up attacking the party. And guess what? Giant constrictor snakes are no joke at level 2. These creatures will easily hit most people on their attack because it's got a plus 6. And they can easily put someone down to 0 HP in the span of a single round, if not two. These creatures have a ton of hit points as well, 60 HP. That is a lot to go through at level 2. So, I don't know how to feel about this encounter in regards of it being a roleplay encounter because the only way your players are going to be able to roleplay these things is if they speak with animals. I personally would suggest that you have these snakes be awakened because, quite frankly, there's a whole bunch of other creatures in this land that are awakened. Why wouldn't these snakes be, right? I think that there's a lot of fun nuance and roleplay you can have if these snakes say, Hey, we're hungry. You need to give us food or else we're going to eat that thing up there. I think you can have a fun dynamic with that because then your players could decide to beat up on these snakes. Maybe your players decide to try and then converse with the snakes, maybe making some intimidation or persuasion check. Or maybe your players just give in and start looking around for some food to give the snakes to appease them. I think there's a lot more nuance to be had with that approach. Now once your players have dealt with the snake, they can climb up top and they will see that Sir Talavar is unfortunately locked in a cage and he cannot get out. Sir Talavar being the most kind and noble of individuals, he will say, Hey, I'm in this situation, can you guys help me? And I'll tell you everything that I know. And you get some nice bullet points there of what Sir Talavar knows. And what's really great is, this really can hook your players into the world at large. They know that they're in the land of Prismere. They know that there are these hags that are controlling this place. They know that they are looking for Zybilna. But in addition to all of that, then they can learn that there is other things going on in the Fey world. Specifically that Sir Talavar is working at the Seely Court and a loyal vassal of the Summer Queen. That clues them in that there is a larger world out there, and that obviously leads to amazing future campaign hooks. So you should totally lean in with that. So this magic bird cage that Sir Talavar finds himself in is going to be nigh untouchable. Your players need a knock spell, but knock is probably not going to be in a level 2 character's repertoire, let's be honest here. So as your players get the cage they have to walk around with sir talavar and that can lead to some fun encounters where your players have to basically be holding on to sir talavar or maybe they put him in some raft that they have and they travel around but eventually the only way to free this guy is either one going to tell me hill or two going all the way back to Bavlorn of Blightstraws. Now it's here in this entry where we get the development of if your players freeze Sir Talavar, they get a plus one dagger, which is pretty cool. It's usually not the greatest weapon. Sometimes the fighters cry because a 
2d6 weapons probably still better than a 1d4 plus one weapon but hey a magic weapon's a magic weapon the interesting thing here is if your players decide to not freeze sir talavar then he's in trouble because after a few hours he slips down and either is swallowed by one of the snakes or is found by the Harangon brigands there's a lot of fun you can have with that in regards of all your players just show up and there's a half-eaten fairy dragon who spouts out something right before he dies or it could be that your players do find Sir Talvar later on in the hands of the brigands as they're interrogating him. You can definitely have this be an encounter that is found later on. And importantly here is Sir Talvar will tell of the brave individual bullywug named Wigglewog. And that'll be useful later on because once your players go to Downfall, they can talk to some of the people around there and they can talk about Wigglewog and maybe that'll make them more sympathetic or maybe they can learn of his poor demise. And now on to Telemi Hill. Telemi Hill is actually a wandering hill with some sentient trees on it, and the hill itself moves around. It's a pretty cool concept in all honesty. And some time ago, a key collecting goblin named Jingle Jingle took up residence here, but recently has not been feeling up to snuff, and the awakened trees are now feeling glum for their chum, and your players can try and fix the situation. When your players arrive here, either because they're searching for a key because they've heard about it, or simply you just have this bee in their path as they walk around, then your players are going to see this hill and they're going to be able to smell its wonderful delights. And as they approach, there's going to be awakened trees that are going to approach them. And they're going to talk to the characters and say, hey, one of our friends is up there. Could you help her out? Should your players accept this quest and climb up the hill, they will find a one cave with a jingle jangle in it. And there's keys just absolutely everywhere. The goblin is a pretty fascinating character here because... Just, you know, just a whole bunch of keys. The key aesthetic. It's pretty cool. Now, your players can just freely take this large silver key, which belongs to Sir Talavar's cage. But the thing is, is I do believe in the value of reciprocity here. Your characters need to do something in return here. If your players don't promise to help out Jingle Jangle in her times of trouble, or they don't offer some sort of item or whatever in her favor then i think that something bad should happen maybe that key all of a sudden turns into a snake or maybe the key doesn't work something because quite frankly just them getting a free card for being scumbags is never a fun time now if your players do go on to ask her what's going on she will say that while she was digging for truffles she was ambushed and they took all of her stuff she will tell them some details about Agdon Longscar for the Brigand Prince of Prismir and the Brigand's Tollway, and how the best guy in Hither is named is Clapperclaw. Your players can get all this valuable detail as they continue on, and this is a great time. As they leave Telemi Hill, if they have promised to help out in all the endeavors, then they are actually given a key which belongs to one of the areas in Bavlorna's cottage. So once again, on that story tracker, make sure you write that down just in cases. And as always, there's always the repercussion of if your players fight Jingle Jangle, then wouldn't you know, Jingle Jangle actually can hold her own a little bit because she's got a cool attack. But more importantly, Awakened Trees are just going to come beat them up. Something to note is Awakened Trees are primarily melee, but what I would suggest is give them a range attack where they throw some peaches or some apples or whatever it is, it's just so that they can have a bit of nuance to them. And now on to the Brigands Tollway. As your players approach, you can talk about how this place just stretches in front of them and how there's rickety causeways of long wooden planks that run all over. And this is a really fun time because as your players approach, they could theoretically get into some combat. And if they do, there's some fun, awesome mini game on the side where if your players are running along, then they have a chance, a seven and eight chance on falling into the water unless they make a deck save. So that adds a bit of nuance to the combat as well. Once again, having fun combat encounters that aren't just flat out 25 by 25 square grids, but giving them some nuance to the battlefield at hand is a great time. Now, as your players are walking along these planks, that is when all of a sudden Agdon Longscarf is going to appear amidst the party. And the reason for that is because he's lickety quick. Now, Agdon Longscarf, much like the rest of his brigands, needs something from the party because that is the rules. 
He is being enforced by Bavlorna Blightstraw to take things from these people, so he's going to politely ask, and if the players don't agree, then presumably a smackdown will ensue. Now, Agdon's a pretty interesting character here. We get, of course, that beautiful little list of traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. We actually get some fun, unique traits about this character. And they also have a Branding Iron. This Branding Iron is extremely unique in that, one, it's very likely to hit level 2 characters here, and does actually a ton of damage. But once he hits somebody, he is invisible to the person that he branded. So during combat, his tactic is going to be trying to hit everybody once. Because once he hits people, then he knows that he's practically well safe from these people because he's invisible. And he's just going to move on to the next person, and to the next person, and to the next person. Now, presumably this is an incredibly tough fight because Agdon himself is really strong. But he's also backed up by a large unit of his own men. Specifically, he is going to have six Herringon Brigands and two Herringon Snipers, each on their own skiffs that are approaching the scenario. So, in the book, we're not given any sort of map. But I have created my own map of this Brigands Tollway just to add some fun complexity to the battlefield because I think there's a ton of fun in that. And something fun you can have is, of course, you can have the Brigands purposely moving slowly because they don't want to fall into the muck. Or you do have them running and because there's a whole bunch of them, they're more likely to fail and then that'll be just a hilarious thing of seeing someone fall off to the side. Now the real way your players are probably going to be agged on is not through direct combat, but if you pay heavy emphasis on the fact that whenever Agdon runs away and runs around, which he should be running after every single time he attacks, you should always try and run away. Have it be that your players see that the scarf trails behind him. If your players get the inclination to try and grab that scarf, they must make a DC 17 athletics check. If they succeed, they grab him. Boom. And he needs to try and get free. He's going to do an opposed athletics check. And if he fails after just one attempt, he is going to immediately surrender. You should try to give your players that detail there of, oh, look at that long scarf. It's flowing right there. It's trailing behind him. And if your players do catch on to that, then absolutely reward them. But if they think that it's just a classic combat, then unfortunately for them, they're probably going to lose. Now, if your players do succeed in beating Agdon, whether because they beat him up or they capture him, or I guess if they kill him, then the rest of the Herringons are going to run away. Anybody that is captured, however, is going to spill the beans. They're going to talk about how they have to give items to Bavlorna and how, even though Agdon would never admit it, a Herringon suspect that their leader is terrified of Slagdar Lorna, who moves on her own crawling lily pad. So once again, just a whole bunch of this fun stuff there. And you all players also get some more insight on the soggy court. Now, combat does boil down. Your players refuse to surrender. Your players refuse to capture him. And unfortunately, they get beat up. Then they aren't going to be killed because nobody in prison is going to kill anybody. They're going to take them to Bav Lorna. So that's just a quick, easy flash and your players arrive there in downfall. Now if your players are successful in beating up the Herringon, then they can make their way through. They can go to the big stump, however there really isn't anything too special there, but it does state that there is scores of trinkets. It doesn't tell us how many there are, but as mentioned before, trinkets are a big deal in this world because that is the currency. So I would say that maybe you make it, there is 1d8 trinkets here that are of worthwhile, but also, very importantly, is lying amid them is the truffles that were stolen from Jingle Jangle. At any given time, there's 1d4 Herringon Brigands and 1d4 Herringon Snipers. If they outnumber the party, they will fight. But if they are outnumbered, then they are going to run. Pretty simple stuff. As mentioned before, I'm working on some maps for some of these locations, and I know that people in the Discord, in the Reddit, in the Facebook groups, I know they're going to be working on maps for these as well. So just always keep your eyes out for those. And now on to Downfall. The awesome thing about Downfall is it gets its own map, which is pretty awesome. So let's dive over there. And would you look at that, this art just springs to life. Because not only do we get this nice side view thing, which presumably your players would get a decent view at. But, I mean, come on, look at that. We get a frog in the corner there, we get the balloon, we get this pot with the, the, the crab leg things. I mean, that's just fantastic. So once your players have arrived at Downfall, they presumably have heard something about Bullywogs or the Soggy Court or something. And they've also probably heard that Bavlorn or Blightstraw is here. So once your players do arrive, then boom, they're going to start interacting with the politics all around, and specifically of the Soggy Court. So in short, the Soggy Court is a whole bunch of bullywugs who are dressed up to be 
basically French aristocrats, and they are all trying to live monarchly lives and are just trying to be all high and fancy, and it's pretty fan friggin tastic because you can totally play into them trying to be regal, but not knowing exactly the proper etiquette. Maybe they're saying the wrong things. Maybe they're doing some sort of weird mannerisms. And of course, they're dressed up funny, which is just absolutely hilarious. And to top it all off, the thing is, is not only are they just trying to act the part, they are trying to do the part and specifically inciting revolution because apparently kings around here don't have too long of a lifespan. And as the kings are just replaced one after another after another, their heads are being mounted on pikes where they are continue to talk, which is pretty interesting here. You can definitely say that's a bit morbid, but you could say that maybe they're still alive, so there's that at least. As your players arriving either by skiff or walking along, that is when they're going to approach Area 1, the channel. As they make their way through, all the thick fog reveals itself, and several bullywugs are going to approach the party and say, hey... Uh, you might want to come with us and we can introduce you to our king. Once again, once again, if combat ensues, then this whole thing is just absolutely going to be borked because, of course, the Bullywugs are just going to keep on fighting and fighting. And, you know, there's not really that much fun nuance to it. Make sure that you have the right players for this game, people. As your players are being escorted along, they approach Area 2, the Damaged Balloon. They're going to see that this thing was clearly jacked up, and they see that there are some people trying to fix the thing. And as your players approach, the Bullywugs once again are going to say, Hey, maybe you should go You see the king. So it states here that they speak in Sylvan, but I would strongly suggest that just everything speaks common because... You know, if people don't speak Sylvan, then there's a huge language barrier and it just gets all boring and dragged down. Just have everybody speak common. Or, something you could do is, you could say that everyone's speaking Sylvan, including your player characters, and they're just now realizing it. I think that's a fun little twist on things. In Area 3, we get Stepstone Crossing, as your players are making their way across all to the rest of the kingdom. Then, boom, they're stepping across, and funnily enough, one of these stones is a Galeb Doer. Now, this is a really funny encounter, because as your players are hopping along, they presumably step on this thing's head, and it pokes up and says, Hey, apologize! And if your players do not give a good enough apology, specifically with that DC-12 Persuasion check, then they do get a second chance. However, they are going to have to do it with a lot more fervor. And if they fail again, then the Galeb Doer is going to animate the boulders all around and fling the PCs into the water. Now, normally this could be just done for a laugh. But unfortunately, this could lead to drastic and, more importantly, incredibly deadly combat. As if your players do fall into the water, they are then being assaulted by Marrow. Now, Marrow are already incredibly challenging characters just on their own to fight, specifically at level 2. But there is two of them, and presumably some of the PCs are in the water, which is really, really bad. So if a fight ensues, your players are going to get absolutely trashed. But thankfully, there is a whole bunch of Bullywugs around, and if the Bullywugs see all this, they're going to start hurling some spears in and drive the Marrow away, and your players can swim to shore, and they probably now are indebted to the Bullywugs. Now, it says here that the Bullywugs don't need anything from anybody else because they don't expect foreigners to uphold the rules of reciprocity. But I say, nah, screw that. Everyone has to do something in return. If you, someone helps you out, then you gotta help them out. Now, it's important to note through all this that as your players are being escorted around here, you should have one named Bullywug be sort of like their de facto guide and say, oh, yes, as you approach here, you can see our burned down balloon factory. And as we're making our way over there, there's the kink. You should have that going on because they shouldn't just be wandering around all willy nilly. And they should probably get to know the Bullywugs just a little bit better. As your players do approach the burned down factory, they can simply go on right past it. But if you have players that are interested, they can poke their head in. And they can actually see that there is still some shenanigans going on. If your players do make their way inside, they will see that there is still some fire going on. And if your players act quickly, they can help out the fight against the fire. And... What's really interesting about this little scenario is there are these six pieces of coal that are burning and these things are actually pretty scary in all honesty. These things are tiny objects and as your players try to fight these things, they actually can fight back. They actually do a bit of damage. So your players do need to be careful if they're trying to fight these little animated coals. But if they do fight them successfully, specifically by, you know, grabbing some buckets of water and hosing them down, then you should be good to go. 
And just to show off of the stat block here of the animated coal, I mean, look at it. It has a plus seven to hit. It does a D4 of damage right there. So the D4 of damage isn't that bad. But the target catches fire, and until the creature takes an action and douses the fire, the target takes another d4 at the start of each of its turns. So if you have six of these, and they're attacking bullywugs, and they're attacking the PCs, then just everyone's catching fire, and then everyone's jumping into the water and coming back out and trying to hose these things down, that is a pretty fun encounter. In Area 5, we have the Chattering Heads. This is where all the previous kings are now having their heads mounted, where they continue to talk and discuss amongst themselves all the quarterly life and all that. And it's really interesting here is, you can definitely play into the fact that there is some monarchs that are saying, Oh, well, I was king for two weeks. And then another one could say, Oh, I was a king for two weeks and a day, you know. And as your players make their way across, maybe that Bullywug guide can tell your players all about each monarch saying, Oh, yes, look at this king. This king lasted a whole 24 hours before a tragedy struck. And, you know, you can totally play into that fun scenario there. But uh, as your players are making their way through, maybe they try and talk to these former kings and discuss all that fun stuff, in which case there's a whole bunch of great bullet points there. But we also get a interaction with Clapperclaw, the guide. Your players need to get on Clapperclaw's good side in order to get to Thither. Well, technically not, but we'll be getting to that later on. Clapperclaw is down on his luck as his previous head, being that of a skull, was stolen by the Herringon gang, and now his new head is that of a gourd with a whole bunch of coins in it that rattle around. He wants his regular head back, and if that is retrieved, then he will gladly join the party in their escapades all around the land of Prismere. So right here, your players may decide to just flip an absolute U-turn and then go to the Herringon place again. But what I would strongly suggest is if your players have already been there, then you could say, oh yeah, during your looking there, you never saw anything like that. But if your players didn't go to the giant stump, then maybe they go there anyway. In which case, you can have any Herringon say, Oh yeah, that skull, we returned it back to Bavlorna. In which case, your players are going to go, Oh man, we were just there. In Area 6, we have His Royal Majesty Gullup the 19th. As your players approach, there they can see this large gazebo where they can talk to the new king and see all of these Bullywug Knights, which are actually insanely strong. Bullywug Knights are actually stated as stronger, essentially, than regular Knights, which is pretty crazy. So like many of the previous Kings, King Gulp the 19th is in hot water right now. He is not looking so good in the eyes of Bavlorna because he has let somebody leave, Sir Talavar, and the balloon was stolen. So his rule is being questioned right now. And he knows that he needs to do anything and everything in his power to make himself look good. He is going to decide to give the players the big book of bad blood, which was previously Babylonians but was stolen. And he's going to try and offer up the PCs as some sort of sacrifice to them. It's not going to work though. Babylon is smart enough to see through the ruse. But the king is trying his utmost to try and appease her. So the great part about this is I know darn well that the overwhelming majority of parties are going to try and get themselves involved in the courtly politics around here between the bully lugs because it's absolutely fantastic. And I know, I know deep down that almost every single group ever is going to say, oh yeah, you know what? Maybe we can become the kings. That would be cool. I know that's going to happen quite a lot. So... As your players are interacting with the king and all of the court around here, that is when at some point someone's going to slip a secret note to the PCs and that note is going to say, find Illig, the Baron of Muckstump, at once. The revolution lives. So right there, your players already walk into a coup occurring. <laughs> so your players are going to start looking around and see what's going on. And they're probably going to start weighing their options. Are they going to try and stick with this king? Are they going to try and help out Illig? Are they going to try and make a coup for themselves? Who knows? In Area 7, we have the Murky Lake. This is basically just the lake all in the center here. Your player characters are going to see bullywugs that are just resting on lily pads, or they're going to see people moving around on skiffs or whatever. Just make this place feel like it's actually lived in and not just some random muck. And of course, your players are going to see Bavlorna's Cottage, but I'm sure that a lot of characters are going to try and look around the area before they head over to the cottage itself. In Area 8, we have the Holding Cells. If your players make the way here, hopefully, once again, they have some guide around here that says, oh yeah, it's just a holding cell, and yeah, there's a prisoner in there right now. 
If you players go and see what's going on with that prisoner, they will discover that there is someone named Morgort, the Knight of Warts. She helped out Sir Talavar trying to escape and is now in deep trouble. There's a lot of great details on her character and she is just a great person because, you know, she's a chivalrous knight. So the thing is though is your players could just approach here on amicable terms, but if your players do start doing something nefarious around here, then they could theoretically be captured, in which case if they are captured, either by the Herringons or maybe by the Bullywugs themselves, then they are going to be in this prison as prisoners themselves. So Morgor can be a great way to have your players learn a whole bunch of information because she knows what's going on, she knows what's up, she knows that Bavlorn is bad news and this new king sucks and blah blah, blah this and that. So Morgor can be a fantastic guide for the player characters if they prove useful. And speaking of proving, let's move on to Area 9, the Proving Grounds. In this area, there is a sort of regal combat. If your players get themselves captured, then they theoretically could be put up on the chopping block here to duel it out with Morgort. In which case, there's actually a fun little scenario because they need to combat one another to free themselves. And what Morgort is going to suggest is, hey, you just, you know, fake stab me or whatever, and I'm going to go down for the count. And when you know it, this is just going by the classic rules of, oh, you won the duel, then you're innocent. <laughs> because, of course. And in which case, your players can be freed, and then they'll probably try and dump Morgort's body somewhere, and then she'll free herself, and then she can try and help out the party later on. In area 10, we have Trinket, Bobble, and Charms. This is a totally awesome little shop that travels around all of the lands, and your players can get themselves some fancy stuff. We can get ourselves a very good thimble with the fingertip not included, mug of bumble beer, da da da, this and that. All these things are completely worthless, but they don't need to be worthless. I definitely think that there could be some fun scenarios brought up by maybe your players do want those ink portraits. Those could prove useful in some way. But there is one item on this list that is not completely worthless. The Moonlight Monocle, which does act as goggles of night, which is pretty cool. So if you are one of the few PCs that doesn't have dark vision, then boom, you can get dark vision. Cool stuff. Now what is interesting is if you do have the unicorn horn here, then your players are going to have to pay for it some way, somehow. But if they don't know the significance of the unicorn horn, then they may not think about it. In which case, your players are going to go on the rest of the adventure. And then later on, at the end, when they know they need it, they're going to say, Oh, we know who has the unicorn horn. And then they can race back to find wherever this shop is. In Area 11, we have the Sinking Palace. This is one of the more finer locations all around, but the issue is, is that your players can't just walk in here because they need an invitation from the king. In which case, if they don't, then they just get barred out. But if they do because of the courtly politics and they get inducted into King Gullop's regime, or maybe they decide to become kings, however it is that they get in here, they'll discover that this place is, you know, accommodating. And also interesting is that there is that clothesline that does go all the way to Bavlorna's cottage. Area 12 is all dealing with Bavlorna's Cottage, and that'll be covered in the next video, so don't you worry about that. In Area 13, we have Big Barkless, a basically living tree with a whole bunch of sprites gathered around it. These sprites are totally mean. They're going to hurl insults, and if need be, they're going to shoot little arrows and try and provoke people into going near the tree and attacking it. And if they do, then the tree is going to start swinging hard, and that's going to be bad news bears for anybody that gets caught up in there. Now, as you can see from the stat block here, this thing will absolutely demolish a level 2 party, a level 3 party. This thing will demolish pretty much any lower level party. Because, my god, multiple attacks here, those grasping roots are just going to be automatically doing damage and grabbing people. The branches themselves are going to be knocking people out in single hits. Just an absolutely destructive creature. So hopefully none of your players do provoke this thing. And if they do, then they need to run. They just need to run away and recognize that they got bamboozled, they got tricked, they got swindled, and just move on. 
What's also interesting here is that there is a clothesline that leads to Bavlorna's. But the interesting thing about that is if the tree blight moves more than five feet further from the cottage, then the clothesline snaps. And then presumably there is one less way to try and get there. In area 14, we have the toadstool patch. As your players make their way around here, they're gonna be hearing very, very sad music. If they approach the person that is causing all this sad noise, they will meet Octavian Milamine. When they talk to Octavian, he will say, oh yeah, my heart was stolen. Not figuratively, but literally. So his heart was stolen by Bavlorna when he made a bad deal, and now the heart is located inside of Bavlorna's cottage. If your players do go in there, get that heart, and swap it out with Octavians, then they actually earn themselves some pipes of haunting. Pretty cool. What's also very interesting is, if your players do succeed in this quest of getting the heart and replacing it, they will learn, potentially, that if you eat the goat's heart, you gain a potion of invulnerability. Which, you know, I don't know how many people are going to be willing to eat a goat's heart, but that's still pretty cool that they get this pretty strong ability. And if your players reconvene Octavian with his heart, then he skips on over to the Wandering Inn, and if your players make their way to the inn, then they can see Octavian again. In Area 15, we have a Bullywug Hut. In here, the players are going to see that this place is relatively empty. But inside of this wooden chest, they will discover some items, including a mummified toad. If the mummified toad is tossed into the pot or kettle, it disappears and produces a darkness spell that emanates from the container and lasts for 10 minutes. So, there is a lot of things your players could do if they learn of this effect, but as written, your players will only find out if they cast the identify spell, which they may not have. So, there is, of course, a lot of things going on there. And also, more importantly, I don't know how many people are going to randomly take this mummified toad and then throw it into the pot. But, you know, if it happens, it happens. In Area 16, we have this other Bullywug hut. And in here, there is a whole bunch of Bullywugs that are plotting some good old-fashioned coup. Now, Illig has a totally sound plan on overthrowing the king. He's going to trip and stab the king in the eye. If the PCs come up with any better idea on how to enact this coup, then he is all ears. But of course, your players are only going to get in here if they say, hey, we're totally with you. So keep that in mind. If your players bash their way inside of here and are clearly just not up for a coup, then there's going to be a little fight that ensues. Also located inside of this room is a crate filled with a whole bunch of taxidermy things that Bavlorna wants. But this is probably something that's going to be delivered after the coup attempt. So here's the funny part of the whole scenario here is if your players do absolutely nothing, they're just onlookers during this whole event, they can have this big old procession where Illig and all the Red New arrives, it's a big old gala, and then boom, Illig accidentally trips into the king, stabs the king in the eye, and then boom, Illig is now the king, and easy peasy, the players become the Duke of Muckstomp, and now everybody loves them. I know... I know so dang well that so many people are going to interrupt that some way, somehow. They're going to interject themselves. They're going to do something, right? So, you know, just keep that in mind. Make sure that you just roll the punches here because this is meant to be goofy as can be. Just a whole bunch of dumb frogs that are just trying to make themselves look cool. And also something important to note is I would strongly recommend that if your players stick around long enough, then some other person is going to try and overthrow Illig, in which case he come up with some dumb harebrained scheme where maybe as Illig is walking along some plank, all of a sudden the plank falls and boom, the person gets attacked by the marrow or something. You can have those scenarios play out easy peasy. In Area 7, we have the King's Mount. In here is this giant toad and if your players walk up here, then they'll meet Vlonk the Guard. Vlonk is just covered in saliva because the toad likes to play this game of swallow the guard. Vlonk's gonna say, hey, can you guys like take over for a little bit while I'll wash myself off? If your players do decide to wash themselves off, then the giant toad's gonna try and swallow somebody. But make sure that there's no damage involved, just have it be just this funny little occasion. In Area 18, we have Bavlorna's Cauldron. This thing is spitting out hot fire, and as your players approach, they may try and see what's cooking, but they'll discover that this thing is locked. If they do try and mess around with it, they'll discover, of course, that it's locked, and it'll just start scuttling away. But, in the fire that is there, there is this magman, and the magman will say, Hey, you want in that cauldron? And he offers to give the PCs the password if he is given dry wood, which can, of course, be found from that shop, 
or if your players are willing to come back at a later time, then they could theoretically get some dry wood from the thither. If the PCs attack the magmen, then unfortunately they're going to be attacked by some of these animated coals as well. And as we saw before, these things can actually be pretty scary if everybody is now on fire. What's really cool about this cauldron is if anybody drinks from this thing, once they get this thing opened, then all of a sudden, boom, they can be hit by the polymorph spell. And they have a 75% chance of turning into a giant frog and a 25% chance of becoming a giant dragonfly. That is extremely cool. There are so many scenarios where becoming a giant frog or a giant dragonfly could be absolutely massive. So if your players do discover this whole thing, then absolutely props to them. They deserve it. Uh, it doesn't state how many things you can take of this potion. What I would strongly recommend is that each PC can get one new dosage of this and that's that end of story. And also, if you're trying to figure out how to do percentages and you don't have percentage die, then just roll a d20 and on a 1 through 5 you become a dragonfly and on a 6 through up you become a giant frog. And also interesting, this is one of the locations of the unicorn horn which is found in the fire pit. But because unicorn horns are so magical and awesome, this thing is not being damaged. And lastly, here in Area 19 we have this watchtower. There is a watchtower here which implies that at some point this must have been useful. Maybe the frogs were getting into fights with other peoples around here or something. But regardless, this watchtower is simply here. There are some bullywugs who are on guard. And there is also a clothesline that leads directly to Bavlornos. So we covered all of the name locations in Chapter 2, except for Bavlorna's Cottage, but Bavlorna's Cottage and Bavlorna herself are going to get their own special video, so stay tuned for that. Chapter 2 is so fascinating because if you're playing it as written, this is the first place your players show up to, and it is an absolute delight. It's this swampy area filled with a whole bunch of friendly and delightful NPCs and a whole bunch of scummy NPCs. And your players have to figure out how they're going to interact with all of these beings. There is some fascinating roleplay to be had. There is some extremely unique combats to be had. And there's just a whole bunch of fun exploration to this world. Chapter 2 is just an absolute delight. And I can't wait to hear all the fun scenarios that players are getting up to. Because I know my group is getting into a whole bunch of shenanigans with the Soggy Court. And I know so many people are going to try and become kings. So I want to hear what you all have to think about that. Tell me down below, what do you think your players are going to be getting up to here? Are they going to be trying to become kings themselves? Are they going to just simply let the court be what it is? Are your players going to go straight to Bavlorna's and not worry about the soggy court at all? And what items do you think your players are going to try and buy from the shop? Go ahead and tell me those things because I would love to hear it. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you for watching. Thanks for listening. And thank you to my amazing patrons. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.